And I'm really interested in this story, to be honest, because I think um, the evil, uh, if I could put it that way, of mobile devices um, and the impact they have on all of our lives is a worry. Um, and Australia, in case you hadn't noticed, everywhere in Australia but the uh, but ACT, the Australian Capital Territory, have banned cell phones in state schools. Uh, it is now nationwide in Australia, and we're going to be asking if we shouldn't be doing that here. Um, and, but should we be tough on kids? Well, I'll tell you one political party that's come out this week and says we should be is ACT. ACT want to bring 17-year-olds, if they are accused of a crime, if they run into to the police, they want them to be dealt with in the adult criminal justice system. Uh, my question is why? And will that reduce what many New Zealanders feel is the surge in crime, the crime wave affecting uh, this country. We are joined now by video link uh, by David Seymour, the leader of the ACT Party. David, good morning to you. Nice to have you back. Good morning, Sean. Good to see you again. All right. Firstly, let's just start with the basics. What happens to a 17-year-old now if they do something wrong and the cops run them in or arrest them or charge them with something? How does it work? Well, they go through the youth justice system and that has a whole lot of options. So maybe they get a warning, maybe they get diversion, maybe they have a family group conference, maybe nothing happens at all. And then there's a small chance at the end of all that uh, that they go to the youth court. Um, now, the youth court then has a whole lot of options, but the, the point of it uh, is not really to punish unless they do something you know, at, at the end of sort of serious crime murder, for example. Mm. Um, the point of it is to try and find a way through and, uh, you know, in one instance, um, everybody hugged in the court at the end, including the victim, the mongrel mob, the perpetrators, the victims' families, they all had mm. a big hug. And that's, that's kind of what they aim for. Um, what we propose is that 17-year-olds don't go through that. Uh, we return to the way the world was before the 1st of July 2019. Uh, and in that world, if you're 17, you get caught, the police decide to press charges, then you're off to a district court like an adult. Does that mean you are also subject to adult sanctions, adult sentencing? Not necessarily. The sentencing remains with the judge um, as it is in any district court. Um, but we want to give them another option, which is a non Oranga Tamariki uh, youth wing of corrections. Uh, and this is a, a separate policy, but it meshes together with what we proposed this week. Um, we want to say that if you're a 17 year old or, or a 16 year old or 18 year old for that matter, uh, you won't go to an Oranga Tamariki facility, which, as we've seen, uh, they, if they're not abusing the kids, they're giving them KFC. Well, we've seen some KFC. instances and regrettable and appalling instances of abuse in Oranga Tamariki or alleged abuse in Oranga Tamariki uh, facilities, but that doesn't mean every kid's being abused there, does it? Well, they've had 17 staff stood down in the last couple of weeks in mm. multiple facilities. I mean, they have got a systemic problem. So is every kid being abused? Of course they're not. Um, but the point is, this is an organisation that has fundamentally failed um, and has major systemic problems. Uh, those problems need to be fixed, no question. Um, but equally, uh, Oranga Tamariki seems incapable of dealing uh, with seriously violent offenders. Um, and so uh, they end up breaking out of their cell, uh, violently uh, uh, assaulting the staff, climbing up on the roof only to be bribed with KFC to get down. Mm. So I just make the point that Oranga Tamariki is, is failing in two ways. It's not caring for kids, it's actually abusing many of them, uh, but it's also not able to punish kids either. And part of the solution to that is to fix Oranga Tamariki, but part of it is to take the worst offenders out and put them in a youth wing of corrections, which ACT is proposed to fund in our um, alternative okay. budget. Okay. All right. Can you tell me, and ACT I think is well known for being logical and researching its policy well, how many 17-year-olds would go before the full justice system a year were this policy to be implemented? How many 17-year-olds are going through youth court at the moment a year? 
Well, at the moment, only around about 400. So it's a, a relatively small number. And only 8% of those, the most serious, actually go before um, the adult court. And this is one of the reasons we want to reverse it. You see, we were promised when this law change was made that the worst offenders, uh, they would go before uh, the adult court. Uh, only 8% of them do. And in one instance, uh, a guy was beaten, a 78-year-old man in his own home, beaten to within an inch of his life. The prosecution said this has got to go before adult court. Um, the judge said, no, no, it's staying in the youth court. So, um, you, you know, it's, it's not just about the number. It's about how many of the serious uh, offences go before the adult court. That's a broken promise. It's much smaller. Um, and another number that's important is that at the moment, if you're a youth offender, i.e. under 17, you're 52% as likely to face police proceedings. So turn that around. Uh, if you're an 18 or 19 year old, it's twice as likely that the police will proceed against you uh, as if you're a youth offender. Now, um, what, what's basically happened is that 17 year olds by being put into the youth offending category um, have just been told you're half as likely to face police proceedings. All right, are you concerned that that means that 17 year olds are being used by older offenders and let's not beat around the bush by gang members and more senior people to do their dirty work for them because they know criminal sanction against the 17-year-old is going to be lesser. Yeah, there's no question about that. I mean, there's, there's been disputes about the extent that, that gangs are involved, but putting that aside, um, a pretty popular or common, I should say, occurrence as I'll go and visit a dairy or convenience store that's been robbed in the Epsom electorate, uh, and they'll say, well, there was a, a, a getaway driver who was older, um, but the, the offenders who actually went into the store and did the violence, did the, the most mm. severe crimes, they were underage. Uh, so these criminals are not stupid. They're planning this out. Uh, and they're making sure that the people who are least likely to face a penalty are the ones that commit the most severe crimes, so, which is, you know, it's a smart strategy, I guess, if, if that's the circumstances you face. Um, but we need to get smart on the state side mm. and make sure that we give them real sanctions. OK. Is this policy change designed to stop some of those 400 kids from committing a crime in the first place? Are you relying on their cognitive ability to say, oh, it's not worth being a criminal or a juvenile delinquent anymore because I will be in the adult justice system. Yeah, I am. And it's interesting to look back at the um, police association. So the police union, they, they, they made a submission to the select committee uh, when the change first happened back in 20... It was actually 2016, 17 that the law was going through Parliament um, to take... 17 year olds out of adult justice and it's interesting to see what the police association said they said right now um, kids offend right up uh, to their 17th birthday and then they stop because they face adult justice if you make this change they will offend right up to their 18th birthday and then stop because they don't want to face youth justice so you know i think in hindsight when we you know we, we voted for this law we, we thought it would work it didn't that's why we got but we've got the courage to change it back in hindsight uh, the police association were correct um, and we should have changed, uh, we should have listened to them uh, because it appears that what's happened is that just as they predicted, um, you know, kids are, are now offending up to their 18th birthday um, and then they reconsider because they've got um, adult penalties. And, and you just got to remember, these are not crimes of passion. These are not people that, you know, find their partner in bed with someone else and, you know, just yeah. knock them off. I mean, th these, are, these are highly premeditated, often filmed on TikTok, uh, these are planned crimes, uh, and that's the kind of crime where people do respond to incentives. All right, why not make it 16 then? Well, you can always make that argument. I mean, you know, let's just be clear. We, we have thresholds um, in society. Uh, out of interest, you have to be 20 to drive an ambulance. You have to be 16 to uh, consent to medicine. You've got to be 18, uh, medical procedure. Uh, you've got to be 18 yeah, well, to vote. But why you know, 17? I mean, why not 16? If the logic works at 17, why not, doesn't it work at 16? 
It could, but I mean, I think once you get into that argument, you're just saying that there shouldn't be thresholds. There's always going to be thresholds, and there'll always well, be. Well, I'm just asking you why set the threshold at 17? 17 is where it was. What we're doing is correcting a clear mistake. Um, we don't have that argument for making it 16. If people want to make that argument, we'll listen. Uh, we're just saying that what was done back in 2019, uh, taking 17-year-olds out of youth justice hasn't worked. It's just given them an extra year of free offending, and we should stop that. All right. Um, do you have the support of your likely government partner or ally, the National Party, in this policy change? Well, it's real interesting to watch what they said on the weekend. They said, oh, well, you know, we'll consider it when we get into government. So, look, I think it's a doable deal. They're not going to come out and support it, but that's why you need ACT. We're pushing the envelope here. Um, we've seen them change their mind on the three three-storey houses. Uh, they've decided to kick Hewaka Ekanoa for touch for another three years. Uh, they followed us within one week on the genetics policy. So, you know, I, I find that um, the Nats can actually be brave and the, the best way to make them brave is give your party vote to act. All right. Um, how many of those 400 kids a year on average that go through the justice system as, as minors with these new rules? What do you want to reduce that by? And can you give us a, a policy target or goal for the reduction? Well, I suspect there'll actually be more um, in a perfect world, Sean, because um, while you know that 400 figure is, is less than it used to be, um, and the people who say there's less kids going before youth court, there's less youth crime, well, well they're, they're half right. Um, but actually, I look at the Ministry of Justice's victimisation surveys, where they go around the community with a clipboard and ask, you know, have you been a victim of a crime lately? Um, more people are being victims of crimes. So I, I don't want to see um, less people uh, coming before the police or coming before the courts as a target. It may be that the right thing is that more people should be apprehended um, and uh, imprisoned, given that more people are reporting that they're a victim of a crime. I mean, you know, last year in the Ministry of Justice's latest survey, 31% of New Zealanders reported being a victim of a crime in one year. Um, that's just totally unacceptable. It's just about one in three people were a victim of a crime. So, you know, we, we got to... I'm not going to set a target for, for less people in jail. That's what Labor did. Um, it may well be that there needs to be more people for a while. Mm. Uh, this has been conflated with calls for 16 years uh, year olds to get the vote. If you are holding people of a certain age uh, responsible to an adult level, shouldn't we also be offering them certain rights that older people have if we're treating them like older people? Sure, but I mean, it's it's an argument that people want to have. It's a different argument. Should there just be one age where, you know, you wake up and you're an adult, you've got all the rights where previously you had none, um, or should there be a graduated series of thresholds and rights and responsibilities as you get older? Um, in New Zealand, for as long as anyone can remember, uh, we have had a, a graduated series of thresholds where um, you know you can work, uh, you can consent to a medical procedure, uh, you can vote. Um, I mentioned driving. You can ambulance. identify your gender. Yep. So what's that say? You can identify your gender. Well, yeah. Well, it's another example, right? So putting a, putting aside the specific. Details. I mean, there's always been a series of graduated uh, rights and responsibilities as you age. And if people want to have the debate about one age where, you know, you suddenly wake up and you're an adult, sure, that's an interesting argument to have. But so long as we have a graduated series of rights and responsibilities, there's no reason why um, you shouldn't be criminally responsible at one age and able to vote at another. Mm. Do you think, David Seymour, that 17-year-olds should be in adult prisons? No, I, I don't. I, I actually think the more that you can um, segregate out prisoners and put them in the right place uh, at the right time, the, the you should, because, you know, there are people who are just hopeless and are just going to be uh, unfixable and that's going to cost the taxpayer a fortune to basically have them in detention for the rest of their lives. We want as few people like that as possible. There are other people that can be rehabilitated. And if we can prevent them uh, from mixing together 
so that the irredeemable prisoners don't you know, spread their ideas to more people, uh, then that's not a bad thing. And therefore, we've proposed that the youth, that corrections have a youth wing, uh, which is secure. You know, if you go there, you won't have your phone, you won't have much fun, um, but and you won't be able to leave. Um, it won't be like you're going to an Oranga Tamariki facility. But equally, we're not going to put you in uh, with a whole lot of hardened criminals who are five or ten years older uh, who will just make you a worse criminal, forcing you to join mm. a gang to survive and so on. Yeah. Uh, so no, that's, that's why we think that there should be corrections youth facilities. As you've said, this is the restoration of a pre-existing policy. It's putting things back to the way they were. Um, I'm getting a few texts in from people saying, really, the people who should be held responsible for youth offending are the parents. Are you considering uh, that policy, which has been talked about a little of late? Yeah, a lot of people talked about it. I mean, I, I question, uh, there's one thing you'd have to work through, which is how practical is it? Because half the time, these youth offenders, their parents are nowhere to be seen. Um, actually... Uh, it's the grandparents that are looking after them because the parents are whacked out on pee. Um, are you going to punish the grandparents? Then they just will decide they're not going to accept these kids. Um, would it include uh, a foster parent uh, that Oranga Tamariki have found for them? So you've got to be a bit cautious. Uh, you know, in, in, the clear, in some instances, you've got a parent there who's just a bit useless, and if they were forced to take responsibility, they might look after their kid. That's, that's the good scenario. Um, but I suspect that a lot of the kids that you're really worried about aren't in that scenario. Um, and actually, there's no one to punish, no one that you can effectively punish. Um, and actually, it's, it's not going to end up uh, solving the problem. So, look, you know, I, I get why people say it, but I just would caution people, have, have a look at the circumstances a lot of these youth offenders are in. Um, either there's no parent to punish or the person in loco parentis is not someone you'd want to punish. Yeah. All right. Um, clearly, this isn't a bottom line. This is just a policy in the context of the debate we're having on law and order. Well, if it's your bottom line as a voter, then there's only one party that's pushing it, uh, and that's X. So All right. So it's not a bottom what, line. What I would, well, what I'd put, what, what I'd put it to people is that you know the more votes that gets, the more of these policies New Zealand will have. Um, you know, you, you only get one vote, just like I have, will have one vote on October 14. Um, I, I can't insist on everything that happens in New Zealand, but I can put uh, my vote with someone that shares my values so that New Zealand goes in my direction. Um, David, I want to thank you for outlining and clarifying what that policy is and how it works. I've got a much better understanding of it now. While I've got you here, our next interview after 7.30 uh, is with the New Zealand Principals Federation to comment on, on developments in Australia where every state, apart from the ACT, and it, this involves youth, has banned cell phones during school hours in state schools. I'm just wondering if you've got a view on this because it's generating quite a bit of interest amongst our audience as a way to maybe focus kids and improve our educational outcomes. Well, I give you the same view that I would give you on just about any educational uh, question, which is to trust your, your local principal, your local community and your local school board. Because just remember that there will be people who say, oh, the government should make every school do this or that. Okay. What you've got to remember is that there's a group of other people there who believe the government should make every school uh, teach this curriculum or... Uh, you know, or not teach, teach uh, science or not teach history. Yeah. Or not teach science or teach this version of sexuality at this age. I mean, you know, so I just make the point that I know there'll be a lot of people who say, yeah, damn straight, make them, you know, take, yeah. put away their cell phone, that'll fix it. Um, but just remember, when you centralise power in education, you create the ability um, for maybe things that you want to be forced on society, but on balance, it's usually the social engineers, the leftists, the people with an agenda for your life um, who will relish the ability to centralise power in education. And that's why I always favour backing a local school and your local community to teach in okay, their Okay, well, here's a straight question that's past the philosophy. Do you think kids should have access to smartphones at school? Uh, look, if, I was choo if it was my kid and I was choosing a, a school uh, for them to go to, um, I, I probably would want a school that had some use of them because they're part of modern life and sometimes there's things they can learn with them. So 
again, it's it's not black and white. Um, and oh, so that's not an answer, schools. David. If you were no, a school no, no, principal, no, no. would you put restrictions on kids using smartphones and devices at school during school hours? Well, but the thing that's that's exactly the point, though, Sean. I'm I'm not a school principal. Okay, I'm a politician. My job is to set not the rules of the question. Case. All right. Uh, Look, and finally, sure. just quickly, uh, do their job. Um, I presume you have got a mobile phone. Yeah, who's it with? Are you with? Um, <laughs> Which socially I, I aware think, mobile provider are you with? Oh, uh, look, I tell you, I, 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 I tell um, I'm with one, which why they changed their name, I don't know. Yeah, but because they didn't just, like paying the Vodafone uh, um, uh, trademark charge, that's why. Yeah, guys, just focus on providing um, internet and communication services at a price we can afford with a reliability we can appreciate. Um, we don't need you to tell us your political opinions. We don't care. It looks pathetic. Bugger off. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Your provider, One New Zealand, actually has upped the ante on this. Oh, I, mean, really? I, I think Spark got into trouble by supporting uh, a comment, a provocative comment by, by a provocative man. They've tried to walk that back, and a whole lot of people are now saying, of course, we're leaving Spark. We're going to go to... One, uh, New Zealand, previously Vodafone. They came out last night, David, and said they don't want TERFs as customers. They were way more uh. proactive. Than so how do you feel about having one or, or Vodafone as your mobile provider, given that they are clearly discriminatory and exclusionary? Well, I just, I just despair. I mean, I, I, I probably, if anything, feel sorry for the the people running the place because they'll have some idiots running their social media accounts who have probably stitched this up with um, Shanil Lal uh, and they'll all be thinking that it's a, a great lark and a lot of fun um, and I just despair for the whole lot. I, I think of the telco engineers that I used to work with back in the day, they'll be sitting there trying to make the network actually work uh, and wondering um, how these idiots got in charge of um, their company's Twitter or thread account. David, I thank you for covering off those other issues without, I might add, prior yep. warning. Uh, thank you, very, no, much right. in, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. That is David Seymour, the leader yep. of ACT, explaining their new, well, youth justice uh, policy. What do you think? He says... They got it wrong. That's relatively rare to hear from a politician, and we're going to put it back to the way it was. It involves 400 kids, or maybe more, four or 500 kids a year in this situation. Also, some interesting views there on the great turf war in our, our mobile and telecommunications uh, company.